Hey everyone, Steve from Backcountry Gallery here. This time I want to share the real reason to shoot raw images instead of JPEG. But first, let's briefly talk about exactly what a raw file is. Basically, a raw file is your unprocessed or minimally processed data from the image sensor in your camera. This data, in and of itself, can't be directly edited with a normal bitmap editor. It has to be converted to a usable format first. This is where our raw processing software, like Lightroom for instance, comes in. Now, the advantage is that because the data is unprocessed, it allows for a much higher degree of post-processing flexibility and image interpretation than maybe an image that's pre-processed by the camera, like a JPEG for instance. However, RAW may not seem all that necessary, at least not at first. The thing is, when people are first trying to decide between RAW and JPEG, they'll often set their camera to capture both at once and then compare the results. What they often see is one of two things. Either the images are virtually identical or the JPEG actually looks better than the RAW file. In fact, let me show you what I mean. Okay, so here's the samples that I wanted to show you. The way I did this is I went out and I shot RAW plus JPEG. So one of these is a RAW file and the other one is a JPEG file. So let's take a look at the differences here. Now, if you'll notice, the image on the left has a nicer sky. I think the blue is much nicer over here. And it looks like it has a little bit better color overall and better contrast than the image here on the right. If we zoom in, you can see that we have slightly better sharpness with the image here on the left than we do with the one on the right. And in fact, let me just move over here and you can take a look at these tree branches and you can see we have much better detail in the image here on the left than we do on the right. And the contrast is better, the sharpness is better, everything's better over here. So I would say between these two, if I was going to pick one to use, I would definitely be favoring the one on the left. So let me show you something though, I think you're going to be surprised. If I turn off lights out mode on Lightroom here, you can see that this is actually the processed JPEG from the camera and this is the raw file. Now this is where people get into trouble because they'll do exactly what I just did. They'll go out and shoot raw and JPEG and they'll compare the images side by side and they'll come to the conclusion that, gee, these JPEGs actually look a lot better than what I'm getting from the raw file. So, you know, you can kind of see where some of the confusion comes in. Not only do JPEGs often look better right out of their camera than their raw counterpart, but they also are significantly smaller. Take the church photos we just compared. The JPEG was shot at the absolute best quality available with my D850, and even then, it was less than half the size of the RAW file. This means JPEGs take up less space on your memory cards and less space on your hard drives. Plus, the smaller image size means that in the field, your camera's buffer can last longer before it fills up. And that's actually not all. JPEGs are also ready to go right out of the camera and they are compatible with pretty much any device. With RAW, you need special software to see the images and you have to process them and export them as JPEGs afterwards. So at this point, you're probably wondering why the heck you'd ever wanna shoot RAW. And that's a good question with just a single answer. Post-processing flexibility. The thing is, when you shoot JPEG, you're more or less stuck with the camera's rendition of the scene. After all, I think we've all had the experience of looking at an image on the back of the camera and discovering it really didn't match the scene in front of us, even if we had the correct settings. In those cases, a RAW file often allows us to process the image so it looks like what we see. Plus, even if the image, as rendered by the camera, is actually pretty good, RAW offers us the flexibility to make the final output even better. So this begs the question, why can't we just process the JPEG instead? Why do we need the RAW file at all? The thing is, JPEGs simply don't have all the information from the sensor and RAW files do. To put this into perspective, our 8-bit JPEGs have 256 brightness levels per RGB channel for a total of just over 16 million colors. That seems like a lot, but the 12-bit RAW file has 4,096 brightness levels per RGB channel for a whopping 68 billion colors. 14-bit, we're talking 16,000 plus brightness levels per channel for a total of 4 trillion colors. As an example, compare an 8-bit JPEG to a 12-bit RAW file. The 8-bit JPEG has less than 1% of the total brightness levels slash colors available to it that the RAW file does. Still, our eyes can only see about 10 million colors, so the 16 million we get in our JPEGs is plenty for our display images. And by the way, I talk all about bit depth and how it works in my exposure and metering book for Nikon if you want more info. But 
Here's the trick. The camera always starts with a raw file, even if you're shooting JPEG. In order to create our 8-bit JPEG image, the camera's JPEG engine needs to decide what data to save and what to toss from the raw file since the JPEG can't hold all the data. So the JPEG is produced based on two things. The first is your settings like exposure, white balance, that sort of thing. And second, how the camera's JPEG engine interprets the data from the scene. It does this assuming that you're not going to want to adjust things like highlights, shadows, or white balance later. The JPEG engine then decides what data it needs to keep from the raw file to create an image that's intended to be used as is. It then creates one possible version of the image and the rest of the data from the raw file is discarded. When the camera's version of the image looks great, then life's wonderful. And the truth is, it probably does that more often than not for most scenes. However, if we want to adjust something after the fact, it's much tougher because we don't have access to that raw file anymore and the necessary data that went with it. Think of it like this. Imagine you had a box containing hundreds of Legos and you wanted to make a little Lego car. The box of Legos is like our raw file information and the car is like our JPEG output. We're not going to use every Lego in the box to create the car, only what we need for this particular version of the car. That's what your camera does when it creates your JPEG output. It uses just the information that it needs from the raw file to output a version of the image from its JPEG engine to your memory card. The problem is, if you want to create a significantly different version of the little Lego car, you'll likely need to go back to the box and grab some other parts. And in the case of our JPEGs, we toss out the box. So while you can do some adjustments, we don't always have everything we need to do it, and that's where we get into trouble. Let me show you. So I think the best way to sort of demonstrate this image information disparity between JPEGs and RAW files is just to show you how this works. So I'm going to use these underexposed images because we're definitely going to see a huge difference here between what we can do with the RAW file and the JPEG. And again, keep in mind the reason is the JPEG is basically the Lego car that we created from our box of Legos. I mean, we have all the information here we need to make this version of the image, but we don't have enough information here to make another version of the image. And I'm going to show you that right now. So what we're going to do is I'm going to jump into the develop module. We'll put this raw file in here and we'll sync up these two images right here. So let's do that. And I have auto sync turned on. So that's going to apply the settings not just to this raw file, but also to the JPEG over here as well. So each image is getting the exact same treatment and then we'll just compare. So let's go ahead and get started. So let's go ahead and start by adding some exposure. We'll brighten this up a little bit, about maybe three and a quarter stops or so. I'm going to pull my highlights down outside there because we don't want this to be too bright in there. I'm going to lift the shadows up so we can see the rafters real nice here. So this is making some pretty good progress with just very little work on our part. I'm going to grab the color picker tool. We have a nice middle tone path right here. So I'm going to give that a click. And you can see we have a nice white balance now. In fact, this is a little oversaturated, so I'm going to go down to the HSL and drop the oranges there just a little bit so this isn't quite as saturated there. That looks pretty good, and it didn't take very long at all. However, let's take a look and see what happened when we tried those same settings on the JPEG. Again, we have auto sync turned on, so both of these images are using the same exact settings. So let's hit compare mode here. And you can see, let me switch these around, and you can see that the JPEG did not fare nearly as well with this exercise as the RAW file did. So the first and most obvious thing here is the massive color shift the JPEG has suffered because of our brightening process here. You can see that it is really, really green compared to the nice colors we have over here. And the reason it went that direction is because the JPEG simply does not have the color information that the RAW file does it was thrown out because it didn't need it for the version of the JPEG that the camera produced. However, believe it or not, that's not even the worst problem here. If we zoom in, you can see that we have lost massive amounts of detail in the shadow areas. And the reason for that, again, is because the JPEG didn't need that information in order to have a nice dark version of this. However, when we try to lift it up, what the software does is it takes the information that's there and then sort of extrapolates what it would look like if it were brighter. The problem is this causes errors, and those errors sort of compound the brighter you push and the harder you 
push those shadow areas and pretty soon you have something that looks a lot like this. So there is a massive difference in quality here and granted the raw file does show some noise here but that's at least correctable. We could fix this. This is completely a lost cause. There's nothing you can do with it. Now I could already hear the YouTube comments though about the color. It's like hey you're not even trying to color correct that JPEG. Maybe you know if you tried a little harder you'd be able to match the raw file and I do want to show you what happens when we try to do that. So let's go ahead and jump to the develop module and we'll just see if we can go ahead and do something with the color here. I have auto sync turned off so it's only going to affect this image right here. So let's start the same way we did with the other image, the raw file version of this one. Let's go grab our color picker and use a neutral here. And as you can see, we didn't get the nice result that we did when we tried that with the raw file. And the reason for that is because of the massive color shift. Basically, this is way, way, way more green than what we were dealing with with the raw file. So a little click out here isn't going to make that work because we've had this huge color shift. When you have a massive color shift like that, you can't just pick a neutral anywhere in the image and have it apply and look nice across the entire image. It doesn't work anymore. So then you do something like this. Your next step is to go over here and try to use the sliders and say, oh, maybe we'll do a little more magenta here and maybe we'll pull out some of the yellow and we're getting this to almost look like wood here but look what happened out here because you're basically just swapping colors back and forth you don't have the color information so you're just adding color casts to various degrees throughout the image when you're pushing the sliders around and it makes getting a good white balance nearly impossible what you have to do is actually go in and try to maybe color correct just small areas of it with either an adjustment brush or within Photoshop but even then it doesn't work out well let me show you because we don't have the subtle color variations. If you look here, we have all sorts of dynamic, deep color variations going on in the wood that are not present here. We cannot recreate this by just coloring this another shade. We have darker colors here and lighter colors here, and we cannot get that back from the JPEG. And that's basically the problem here, is that when you try to process a JPEG, even if you're not as extreme as this, if you're trying to pull shadows or adjust color or anything like that, you don't have much flexibility before you start running into these kinds of problems. And that's why everyone likes shooting raw files over JPEGs, because we do have this flexibility and we can maintain this nice look to our images when we do need to adjust them. So it gives you a lot of flexibility after the fact. But it's not just about the shadows and the colors. We also have a pretty big advantage with highlights. So let's take a look at a version of this scene that was overexposed and take a look at how the highlights react. So here we have the two overexposed versions, the JPEG on the left and the RAW on the right. And for this example, I just want to concentrate on the highlights and we'll see what we can do with the RAW file versus the JPEG in this particular scenario. So head over to the Develop module, make sure we have the RAW file selected and Auto Sync on. So once again, the changes we make to the RAW file will also be applied to the JPEG. I'm going to go ahead and drop that exposure down about there and maybe drop those highlights down. Let's set that white balance again, just doing this very quickly for you. And let's bring up the shadows so we can see the rafters. Just like that, the image is pretty much done. Let's go ahead and compare it to the JPEG. And as you can see, the JPEG has not fared quite as well. Once again, even the bright areas here do not look quite as good as what we have with the raw file as far as color goes. But again, we're concentrating this one on just the outside areas here that are overexposed. So as you can see, we have really nice detail here in the path and the color on the grass looks good. In this case, the detail is all but gone and the grass looks terrible. If you look at the building itself here, you can see that we've lost all the detail here and we still have very nice detail here. And if we go up into the branches, you can see that the JPEG does not hold up to the raw file at all. So what does that mean? Well, simply that the raw file has more information. Once again, we're dealing in this case with a 14-bit file, so it has much more dynamic range and it has far more tonal levels than our 8-bit JPEG. Plus, the JPEG was created, again, to create an overexposed version of this image. It wasn't created to make this. So once again, going back to our Lego car analogy, we're taking a Lego car that was supposed to be one way and trying to make it into something else, and we just don't have the parts available to make that happen with our JPEG. Now, I know what you're thinking. 
hey, what about like a more normally exposed image instead of these severe examples? Let's take a look at that too. Okay, so here's a JPEG that is properly exposed for the scene that we've been working on the last few minutes. And as you can see, it's okay, but it's not great. The problem that we're having here is that there's a pretty wide range of light here. We have some pretty bright light out here, and we have some darker light inside here. And by the way, this barn is open on both sides, so it was open behind me while I was shooting this. So when I was standing there, I could actually see a lot more detail up here than what I'm seeing here, and I could see a lot more detail outside than what's kind of getting a little bit blown away here. And as far as this image goes, this is probably about the best exposure I could do for the JPEG because I wanted to be able to see this, but I also wanted to be able to see that, so I had to compromise, and this was about the best exposure. So let's go ahead and take a look at what I could do with this image, though, as a RAW file, my version of it. This is my version of that exact same photo. So the camera did this with the RAW file. I did this with the RAW file. And that's really the point that I want to drive home here. Because I had all the information, I was able to lift these shadows up so that they looked more like what I saw when I was standing there. I was able to bring these highlights down so that, again, they looked more like what I saw when I was standing there. When I was there that morning, I could see all the information up here, all the detail up here. I had some nice warm light coming through behind these houses here, this house here and this barn here. And this is a much more faithful representation of the image than this one was. But the problem is, had I shot just straight JPEGs and no RAWs, this is the one I would have been stuck with. I would never have had the opportunity to do this one because this is what happens when I tried to correct the JPEG to make it look like the RAW file. It doesn't look very good. The RAW file is the one that you want and it definitely gives you the best quality. And again, this is just one interpretation of the RAW file. The camera did this, I did this. And this took all of five minutes, by the way. And that brings me to another point, though. One thing I hear all the time is that the reason people shoot JPEGs is because they want a faithful representation of the scene. The problem is, that's not how it works. Just look at picture profiles, for example. My Z7 has 28 different picture profiles that can be used and applied to create a single JPEG output. Each one will give a different version of the same raw data. This means, no matter what, your image is getting processed. In my mind, if you use JPEGs, you're putting that post-processing into the hands of an engineer at a desk somewhere far, far away. That person has never seen you and they certainly don't know what you just photographed. The problem is, unless the people programming the JPEG processing algorithms are there when you snap the photo, there's no way the camera can know the perfect way to process it. And so far, I've never caught a programmer with a notebook lurking in the bushes while I shoot, so I don't think the way these images are processed is gonna change anytime soon. So anyway, in my opinion, if the image is gonna get processed, I think it's better to be processed by the person who actually captured it. Finally, don't get me wrong, there is still a place for JPEGs. For example, I personally use them for things like, I don't know, birthday parties, pet photos, family gatherings, things of that nature, where I don't really want to have to spend any time post-processing and the JPEG can handle the job. It's not uncommon to see them used when the photographer needs to quickly post them maybe to get the images to press or social media or something like that with a magazine. Everyone has different needs and there's never a one-size-fits-all answer. However, I can tell you that for me personally, for my serious work, my wildlife and landscapes, I always shoot raw and take the do-it-yourself approach to post-processing. The truth is, I very seldom shoot JPEG. So that's about it. If you're a Nikon or Sony shooter and want to learn how to set your camera for raw shooting, stick around to the very end of this video. Again, make sure you check out my ebook, Secrets to Exposure and Metering for Nikon. Not only will it give you more info on the topics discussed in this video, it will teach you everything you ever wanted to know about exposure and metering, from how your meter works, to metering modes, to shooting in manual mode, to how to use ISO and how it works, and shutter speed and aperture, and how that all works together. We leave no stone unturned in this book's 670 pages. It even covers advanced topics like bit depth, ISO invariance, and ETTR. Check it out. I think you'll like it. Also, make sure you stop by the site and sign up for my free email newsletter so you never miss a blog post or video. And of course, you'd be my hero if you'd like, subscribe, and click that little notify bell. Thanks so much for watching, and have a great day. And if you want to learn how to set your Nikon or Sony for raw shooting, stick around. We're doing it right now. 
Okay, before we begin, I want to discuss raw bit depth. However, this is just going to be kind of very basic general info and recommendations to get you started. There's actually a lot more to this topic than I have time for here. In fact, it takes up like most of a chapter in my exposure and metering book. The main difference though between 12 and 14 bit is the amount of dynamic range the file can hold. A 14 bit file can hold roughly two stops more dynamic range than a 12 bit file can. However, it's nearly impossible to tell the difference between the two options in a normal photo. Where 14-bit can give you a potential advantage is if you're shooting lower ISOs and really, really need to pull shadows like three, four, or five stops. In that case, it's possible you'll see a little better result in the shadows, the deep shadows, with a 14-bit file instead of a 12-bit file. On the other hand, 12-bit files are smaller and take up less space on your memory cards, a handy option if you're running out of space on those memory cards in the field. In addition, the smaller 12-bit files take longer to fill your camera's buffer. In fact, I often recommend shooting 12-bit for action if it seems like you're always bumping up against that buffer during longer bursts. Generally speaking, on most cameras, you lose roughly a stop of dynamic range for every stop of ISO over base ISO. So again, very generally speaking, on most cameras, if you're shooting over ISO 400, you can fit the useful dynamic range of the image into that 12-bit file space and will see no difference between 12 and 14-bit files. Personally, I usually leave my Nikons set to 14-bit. However, if I'm running out of card space or need a little extra room in the buffer, I don't hesitate to switch to 12-bit. And there's actually been entire trips I've shot completely at 12-bit since I was nearly always above ISO 400 on those trips. Sony, however, doesn't give you a menu option to switch from 12 to 14-bit, <laughs> at least not that I'm able to find. Modern Sonys will shoot 14-bit all the time unless you're doing like a long exposure with long exposure noise reduction enabled, or if you're shooting in bulb mode, or, and this is the big one, during continuous shooting when your file type is set to compressed raw. Under those three circumstances, it will shoot 12-bit. So if you do want to sort of force your Sony to switch to 12-bit, compressed raw in continuous mode is one way to do it. Anyhow, that's the crash course. Let's take a look at setup. Okay, so here we are on the back of a Nikon. This happens to be a Z7, but pretty much every Nikon looks a lot like this. What you're going to do is go to the photo shooting menu. That's the one with the little camera here. And what you want to find is the image quality option. That's where we can set RAW. On this camera, it's about the fifth slot down, but it might be in a different location depending on which camera and the age of the camera and things like that. So look for something called image quality under the photo shooting menu. Give that a click with the OK button. And what you want to do is have it set the way I have this set, just to RAW. Now there is the JPEG plus RAW options up here, but personally I don't see a lot of reason to do that because we can make JPEGs from our RAW files. So in this case I'm just going to go ahead and select NEF RAW, and that's it. We are now set for RAW shooting. However, we do have some other options. If we go down to where it says NEF RAW recording, when you find that menu option, hit the OK button, and you'll find two options typically under there. The first one is all about compression. I have it on right now. I have lossless compressed, and truthfully, that is really the only one I recommend. Compressed actually throws out data, so we don't want to do that one, and uncompressed is just making big files for no reason at all. So lossless compressed is really the only thing you should be choosing here. Next, we have the bit depth option here. And right now, I have it set to 14-bit, and we have 12 and 14-bit options there. Again, most of the time, I start off at least at 14-bit and then make my decision as to whether I want 12 or 14 once I'm in the field. So I'm going to set that to 14-bit, and that's all there is to setting up a Nikon for raw shooting. Okay, so you're looking at the back of my Sony A9 Mark II, and the first thing we want to do is go to that little camera option, camera number one there, and go down to file format, and we're going to select raw from the file format menu here. We can do raw and JPEG or JPEG, but I recommend just using raw because you can always make JPEGs from your raw files. So let's go ahead and select that. Next we have the raw file type, 
and we have some options for compressed or uncompressed. That's pretty much it. Unfortunately, unlike Nikon, Sony does not have a lossless compressed option. So we are going to discard some data with the compressed option. Now, in practice, I've played with this back and forth, and I have not seen a significant difference between compressed and uncompressed yet. But to be fair, I have not shot the Sony nearly as long or as much as I've shot the Nikon. So down the road, I may change my tune about that. However, there are a few things to consider here. The first one is that if you're shooting uncompressed, you're going to get those 14-bit files. If you switch to compressed and you're in continuous shooting mode, you'll get those 12-bit files. So depending on what you need, you may have to consider those options as you're debating whether you want compressed or uncompressed. So if you wanted to save some space in your buffer or in your memory cards, maybe you want to try compressed so that you can fit a little bit more information into both of those places. But, you know, obviously up to you, whichever one you decide. My default with this is just to leave it uncompressed. And then if I need a higher frame rate, in, my, in the case of my Sony A9 Mark II, I'm limited to about, I believe, 12 frames per second if I'm in uncompressed raw. But if I go to compressed raw, I can get that 20 frames a second. So it all depends on what I need. So I switch these around quite a bit. But my usual start position for this is uncompressed. And I can always bop back in here and change it if I want to. So that finally wraps us up. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.